I remember the first time I suspected something was off. The little things. A whispered phone call. Her phone screen angled away just so. And then one day, I found it, a text message from someone named D, it was nothing overt, just a, can't wait to see you tonight but the time it was sent. That's what did it. The exact moment she told me she was staying late at work for a meeting, I didn't confront her, not immediately. No, I was too smart for that. Instead, I started watching her more closely, taking mental notes of all the discrepancies, the lies. And slowly, a plan began to form. If she was betraying me, I'd make her pay for it. But it wouldn't be as simple as just catching her in the act. No, I wanted her to suffer, to feel a fear so deep it would consume her. And I knew just how to do it that I spent weeks preparing, leaving nothing to chance. The house had to be perfect, down to the last detail. I faked my own death, an accident meticulously staged to be convincing, complete with a farewell note that would leave no doubt. In it, I confessed to knowing about her affair, describing in painful detail the agony it had caused me. I wrote about how I couldn't bear to live anymore, how the thought of her with another man had driven me to the brink. It was a masterpiece of guilt and despair, the authorities bought it. They found the note and my carefully planted evidence. As far as the world was concerned, I was gone, a tragic victim of a broken heart. She was left alone, presumably widowed, with only her guilt for company. But that was just the beginning that I and the days following my death, I kept a low profile, staying far away from our home, from the places anyone might recognize me. It wasn't easy, but I was driven by a dark satisfaction. The thought of her discovering my lifeless body, reading that note, feeling the crushing weight of what she'd done, that kept me going but I didn't just want her to feel guilty. I wanted her to be terrified. To think that my spirit had come back, seeking revenge. So, I waited, biding my time until the funeral was over, and she was alone in that big, empty house that IT started with little things. Just enough to make her question her sanity. I still had the keys, of course, why wouldn't I? Late at night, when I knew she'd be asleep, I'd slip inside. I'd move things just a little, her keys, her jewelry, the picture frames on the wall. Subtle, almost imperceptible changes, but enough that she'd noticed that I left muddy footprints on the floor one night, leading from the front door to our, no, her bedroom. Another time, I opened every drawer in the kitchen, leaving them slightly ajar, as if someone had been rummaging through them. And then, the phone calls started that I used a burner phone, masking my number. I never said anything, just breathed heavily into the receiver before hanging up. I'd wait until the dead of night, knowing she'd be alone in the dark, wondering if she'd heard something or if it was just her imagination that IT didn't take long before she was jumping at shadows, her eyes wide and haunted. I could see it in the way she moved, the way she clutched her phone as if it were a lifeline. And still, I wasn't done, the climax of my plan came one cold, rainy night. I waited until she was out, probably with him, though I couldn't be sure. I let myself into the house, this time with something more, personal in mind that I walked through the rooms, taking in the familiar scent, the memories we'd once shared. It was almost as if I were a ghost myself, wandering through the remnants of a life that had once been mine. I went to the bedroom, where I knew she'd find it, my wedding ring, carefully placed on her pillow and on the bathroom mirror, in red lipstick, I wrote the words, I'm still here, then I left, disappearing into the night, imagining the look on her face when she returned home. Would she scream? Cry? Collapse into a quivering mess on the floor? I could only hope when she returned home that night, I was watching from a distance, hidden in the shadows. I saw her park the car, hesitating before getting out, like she was stealing herself for something. That's when I knew, she was already on edge. Perfect, she unlocked the door slowly, almost as if she was afraid of what she might find on the other side. I could imagine her walking through the dark house, the silence pressing in around her. The footsteps would echo, each one amplifying her dread, leading her closer to the bedroom that I waited for it. The moment when she would see what I had done. Her scream pierced the quiet night, 
loud enough that I almost flinched. But it wasn't just a scream of shock, it was raw, primal fear. She stumbled backward, out of the bedroom, her breath coming in ragged gasps. I could see her from my hiding place, her hands trembling as she stared at the ring on the pillow, the words on the mirror, she was breaking, just as I had planned, she grabbed her phone, her fingers fumbling to dial a number. I couldn't hear the conversation, but I didn't need to. The tears streaming down her face told me everything. She was scared out of her mind, terrified that her dead husband had returned to torment her, over the next few days, I escalated things. It wasn't just about moving objects anymore, it was about making her feel hunted. I knew her schedule, knew when she would be alone, vulnerable. I began leaving notes, each one more ominous than the last, you can't hide from me, I'm watching, do you miss me, they were simple, but effective. I'd leave them in places she couldn't ignore, taped to the bathroom mirror, slipped into her purse, even tucked under her pillow. The fear was eating away at her, making her jumpy, paranoid. She was barely sleeping, and when she did, I was there to ensure it wasn't peaceful that I started tapping on the windows at night, just lightly enough to wake her but not enough to pinpoint the source. Once, I even entered the house while she slept, standing in the doorway of her bedroom, just watching her. I knew she wouldn't wake up, not after what I'd done. I had spiked her drink earlier that day, ensuring she would sleep deeply. I wanted to be close, to feel the power of watching her, knowing she was utterly helpless, but it was never about hurting her physically, it was about destroying her mentally. Every morning, she would find another clue that I had been there, another sign that her dead husband was closer than she wanted to believe. And every day, she grew more unhinged. Point one night, she finally snapped. I watched her from outside as she frantically paced the living room, talking to herself, her voice a frantic whisper. She grabbed a bottle of wine, downing half of it in one go, her hands shaking so badly that she nearly dropped the glass, and then she did something I hadn't expected, she pulled out a gun from the drawer in the coffee table. My heart skipped a beat. I hadn't anticipated this. The plan was to torment her, to make her live in fear, but I never wanted it to go this far. She checked the chamber, her eyes wild, desperate, as she held the gun close, like it was her last line of defense against the ghost she believed was after her that I knew I had to act fast. This was spiraling out of control, and if I didn't stop her, she might do something irreversible, but was that really what I wanted? To stop her? Or was this the inevitable end of the twisted game I had started, as I watched her with the gun, I felt a strange mix of satisfaction and unease. The plan was working, too well. She was terrified, unraveling before my eyes, but there was something else I hadn't anticipated. The power I held over her, the control, it felt intoxicating and terrifying all at once. I was no longer just a man seeking revenge, I had become something darker, something I didn't entirely recognize, but then something happened that I hadn't planned for, a knock at the door. It was soft at first, then more insistent. She jumped, nearly dropping the gun as she whipped around to face the door. Her eyes were wide with panic, her breath coming in shallow, rapid gasps. I could see her debating whether to answer it, fear battling with curiosity, slowly, she approached the door, the gun trembling in her hand. She pressed her eye to the peephole, and I could see the confusion flicker across her face. Whoever was on the other side wasn't who she expected, finally, she opened the door, just a crack, still keeping the chain on. Who is it? Her voice was shaky, almost unrecognizable, Lisa, it's me, a man's voice, calm, concerned. I felt a jolt of recognition, it was him, the man she'd been seeing, the one I had only known as, D, my heart pounded in my chest as I realized what this could mean, David, she whispered, her voice breaking. She unlatched the chain and flung the door open, her relief palpable. He stepped inside quickly, closing the door behind him, his eyes scanning the room as if searching for danger, Lisa, what's going on? You haven't been answering my calls. I've been worried sick, his tone was gentle, but there was an edge to it, a hint of something deeper, she looked at him, her eyes filling with tears. David, he's here. I swear, he's here. He's been in the house. 
He's haunting me, her voice was barely a whisper now, trembling with fear, David frowned, his brow furrowing in confusion. What are you talking about? Who's here, my husband, James? She choked out the words, her eyes darting around the room as if expecting me to appear at any moment. He knows about us, David. He's been leaving notes, moving things. I thought I was going crazy, but it's real. I know it's real, for a moment, David just stared at her, disbelief etched across his face. Then he shook his head, taking a step closer to her. Lisa, that's impossible. James is dead. You told me yourself, he's gone, she shook her head frantically, her tears spilling over. No, you don't understand. He's here, in this house. I can feel him. He left his wedding ring on my pillow, wrote on the mirror. I. I don't know what to do anymore, David looked at her, his expression softening with pity. He reached out, taking the gun from her trembling hands, gently setting it on the table. Lisa, listen to me. You're just exhausted, stressed out. Losing James was traumatic, and this is just your mind playing tricks on you but I could see in her eyes that she wasn't convinced. She knew what she had seen, what she had felt. And so did I. David pulled her into a tight embrace, whispering soothing words into her hair. She clung to him, her body shaking with sobs. I watched them, hidden in the shadows, my heart pounding in my chest. This wasn't how it was supposed to go. He wasn't supposed to show up, wasn't supposed to comfort her. She was supposed to be alone, vulnerable, consumed by fear, but now, as I stood there, something inside me shifted. This wasn't about just tormenting her anymore. This was about him, too. The man who had taken my place, who had made me feel like a ghost in my own life long before I had ever planned to become one that I needed to end this, once and for all. But how? I retreated into the night, formulating my next move. Lisa wasn't the only one who needed to feel the fear. David would have to face it too, face me. But I couldn't just scare them now. I needed to make them see the truth, to confront them in a way they couldn't deny. They had to know that the man they thought was gone was very much alive, and I was coming for them, the next few days were a blur of carefully planned chaos. David had moved in with Lisa, sleeping in the bed I once shared with her, trying to protect her from the ghost she believed was haunting her. I could see their bond growing stronger, their fear of me pushing them closer together. But they had no idea that I was still watching, still pulling the strings that I needed to make my next move, the one that would push them over the edge. But I had to be careful, it was a delicate balance between terror and truth. I had to make them believe, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that I was still here, that I was in control. That the man they thought was dead had returned with a vengeance, the opportunity came on a stormy night. The kind of night that made the house creak and groan, where shadows seemed to move on their own, and the wind howled like a chorus of lost souls. I knew it would be perfect that I waited until they were both asleep, their breathing deep and even. Then I slipped into the house, moving silently through the darkness. My heart pounded in my chest as I approached the bedroom door, pushing it open just enough to see them lying there, oblivious to the storm raging outside, and the one about to hit inside that I started with the lights. The ones in the hallway flickered on and off, casting eerie shadows that danced across the walls. I heard David stir, but he didn't wake. Good. I wanted them both to be fully awake when it happened, next, I went to the kitchen. The knives gleamed in the dim light as I carefully selected the largest one. I wasn't going to use it on them, at least not physically. But I knew the sight of it would be enough to drive them over the edge that I placed the knife on the nightstand next to Lisa's side of the bed, making sure it was positioned just right. Then, using a trick I had learned in my research, I tied a thin, almost invisible thread to the end of the knife and led it out of the room, through the door, and down the hallway. When the time came, I could pull it from a distance, making it look as if the knife had moved on its own, with everything in place, I took a deep breath and stepped back into the hallway, pulling the door shut behind me. The storm outside had reached its peak, thunder rumbling through the house like an angry beast. 
I could hear the wind whipping against the windows, rattling them in their frames that it was time that I pulled the thread gently, just enough to nudge the knife a fraction of an inch. I knew it would be enough. From their bed, it would look as if the knife had moved on its own that I heard Lisa gasp, a small, sharp intake of breath that sent a thrill through me. She was awake, David, she whispered, her voice trembling. David, wake up, I pulled the thread again, this time a bit harder. The knife slid closer to the edge of the nightstand, what is it, David mumbled, still half asleep, look, Lisa said, her voice rising in panic. The knife, it's moving, what, David was fully awake now, his voice sharp with alarm. What are you talking about, I pulled the thread one last time, and the knife toppled off the nightstand, clattering to the floor with a metallic crash. The sound echoed through the room, drowning out the storm outside, Jesus Christ, David shouted, scrambling out of bed. He grabbed the knife, staring at it like it was some kind of cursed object. How the hell did this get here, Lisa was sobbing now, her hands covering her face. It's him, David. It's James. He's here, David turned to her, his face pale, eyes wide with fear and disbelief. Lisa, that's impossible. It's just, it's not possible but even as he said the words, I could see the doubt creeping into his mind. He was starting to believe and that's when I made my move that I slipped into the room silently, staying in the shadows. They were too focused on the knife to notice me, too consumed by their growing terror. I moved closer, close enough to smell their fear, to feel the tension in the air and then, in a voice barely above a whisper, I said, I'm not dead, they froze, their eyes darting around the room, searching for the source of the voice. I could see the realization dawning on their faces, the cold, horrifying truth sinking in that I stepped into the light, and for the first time, they saw me. Lisa screamed, a sound so raw and primal it sent chills down my spine. David dropped the knife, his face going as white as a sheet, it's not possible, he whispered, his voice trembling. You're dead. We, we buried you, did you really think I'd let you get away with it, I said, my voice cold, dripping with malice. Did you think I wouldn't find out? That I wouldn't come back, I took a step closer, and they both backed away, their fear palpable. Lisa was sobbing uncontrollably, her hands trembling as she clung to David. But there was nothing he could do to protect her now, this ends tonight, I said, my voice low and menacing. You destroyed my life. Now, I'm going to destroy yours, I reached for the knife, picking it up slowly, deliberately. They flinched, fear radiating off them like heat. I savored the moment, the power I held over them, the sweet taste of revenge, but then something unexpected happened. David stepped forward, putting himself between me and Lisa. His hands were shaking, his face pale, but his voice was steady as he said, James, this isn't you. Whatever you're planning, whatever you're feeling right now, it's not you. You don't have to do this, for a moment, I hesitated, the knife heavy in my hand. The words hit me harder than I expected, cutting through the rage and bitterness that had consumed me for so long. I saw the fear in his eyes, but also something else, pity. He wasn't just afraid of me, he felt sorry for me and that, more than anything else, made me stop that I looked at Lisa, her tear-streaked face twisted with fear, and then at David, standing there with a courage I hadn't expected. Suddenly, I felt exhausted, the weight of what I had done crashing down on me that I lowered the knife, the anger draining out of me like air from a punctured balloon. You're right, I said, my voice hollow. This isn't me, I dropped the knife to the floor with a clatter, the sound echoing through the room like a death knell. They both flinched, but I didn't care anymore. The fight had gone out of me that I turned and walked out of the room, out of the house, into the stormy night. I didn't know where I was going or what I would do next. All I knew was that the revenge I had so carefully planned, the terror I had inflicted, it wasn't worth it that it would never bring back the life I had lost that as I disappeared into the night, leaving the wreckage of my plan behind, I realized that the real ghost wasn't me. It was the man I had once been, the life I had once lived. That man was gone, and nothing I did could ever bring him back.